Okay, folks. We have a welcome to the uh, welcome to the fall 2018 uh, edition of the uh, annual GRASP uh, seminar. I'm delighted to see you all and uh, welcome you here. I'm uh, Dan Karachuk. I'm the interim uh, director of the uh, GRASP laboratory uh, for the year, and uh, we have a uh, great lineup of uh, faculty and faculty representatives to give you some feeling for um, what's going on uh, in the. Uh, lab, uh, and then uh, the uh, seminar series, which is posted on the grass lab, looks uh, like it's going to be great. It's going to be a great year. Uh, you can see much of the semester, uh, almost all the semester is laid out there. Uh, and uh, we'll be uh, delighted to uh, uh, see all of you and more of you for the, uh, as the semester pans out. Um, the uh, GRASP lab uh, overview is uh, pretty uh, uh, impressive. Uh, whenever I go and uh, present uh, on behalf of the uh, uh, university's group, we always, uh, we always, all, all these places that are much bigger than us never quite look so good as we do, so that's a nice thing. We have about 15 faculty, plus or minus, depending on how you count. Uh, a number of uh, very exciting recent hires. Uh, uh, more coming, uh, we, we trust. Um, in uh, uh, computer science, uh, we've got uh, um, a, a mix of faculty and uh, in MEME and ESE, and we have uh, a, a recent, uh, relatively recent hire in the uh, School of Medicine, Professor Michelle Johnson. Uh, I think uh, Michael will be uh, representing her later. Um, quickly, the speakers that you'll hear today, we have um, uh, 11 speakers, and so I'm going to get out of the way as quickly as I can. I, I'm going to give each of our speakers um, five minutes. The crickets will chirp at five minutes, and then it, there'll be 60 seconds to make the uh, transition. Otherwise, we're not going to uh, keep ourselves uh, to the hour. Um, quickly, uh, uh, yeah, so we have a wonderful p a group of PhD students, uh, now close to 100, apparently. Um, a great cohort of postdocs, uh, at least 20 postdocs, last time I counted. Um, wonderful, wonderful master students, uh, many of whom I, I see in the room. And uh, roughly speaking, we're at, at about $15 million a year um, with these uh, 15 faculty uh, members. So uh, $14 million is, you know, very, very nice uh, funding. Many industrial and many uh, government partnerships on the way. Those of you who are uh, stationed at GRASP uh, at Levin uh, know uh, the ins and outs of the uh, GRASP lab here. Many of you have been to Perch. Uh, I encourage you all to come down and visit at some point in the coming semester. Uh, there's a shuttle and there's information on the GRASP website as to how to get down there. Um, the lineup of faculty will be, we'll have, uh, we're going more or less in alphabetical order. We'll have uh, uh, Professor uh, Danielidis uh, start us off on, on computer vision and uh, Professors uh, Taylor and she uh, toward the end of the uh, lineup uh, on the, the work in computer vision. So there's tremendous uh, excitement and uh, um, advances going on in uh, their groups in computer vision. Uh, we all have uh, Professor uh, Eric Eaton uh, talk to us about the work he and his group are doing in lifelong learning. Um, we'll get a, a talk from uh, Professor Ani Shea about the, uh, the, uh, the variety, the various work that's going on in her laboratory. Um, my, Dr. My, uh, Professor Michael Poza will be uh, uh, giving uh, an account, a quick account of his uh, a dynamic autonomy and intelligence uh, laboratory. Uh, Professor Johnson is going to be represented by uh, uh, Michael, right? So Rivera. Uh, uh, we'll have a uh, presentation by Professor Cynthia Sung on her uh, work in origami robots and more. Uh, we're lucky to have uh, uh, Mark Yim in the audience, and Mark Yim talks, does everything. He does modular robots, he, does, he just does lots and lots of stuff, and so I'll let him uh, talk to you about all the stuff that's going on in his group. Um, we'll uh, have a, a presentation at the end of the, uh, toward the end of the uh, uh, discussion by uh, Dan Amurueda, who's our uh, outreach director, uh, and um, we, who you won't see today is you won't see our wonderful colleague and dean, uh, Vijay Kumar. He won't be presenting, and I don't think uh, uh, we lined anybody up, uh, but uh, uh, his group is doing many, many different exciting things. Uh, you won't see a talk from me or my group. Uh, you know, come down and see us at Perch if you're interested, or come to office hours. Um, and of course, the, uh, the real secret weapon, the real strength, of the GRASP lab uh, is the uh, is, is you guys, uh, the students, uh, and uh, we're excited to have you here. Uh, and uh, 
we look forward to many, many uh, great uh, uh, pieces of work and uh, accomplishments with you. All right, that said, I'm going to get off the stage, and our first speaker is uh, Stephen, for, uh, Stephen Carter for Professor uh, Daniels. Ah, okay. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen Phillips. I'm here presenting for Casa San Lise, who is in Europe for a conference right now, so he cannot be here, but I'll do my best to present all the work going on in his lab. So uh, we're a computer vision lab, as uh, Professor Karczak said. We do mostly geometric computer vision, although our lab is fairly big, so we do quite a few things. Um, so as being in computer vision, the hot new thing these days is deep learning. And so we want to incorporate uh, geometry, which our lab focuses on, into deep learning. So this line of work right here, which comes from uh, students Carlos and Christine in our lab, basically you take a 3D object and you represent it using um, spherical coordinates. And from there, you can do convolutions on the sphere so that it uh, it can adapt to rotation, and so you can classify this particular X-wing, for instance, uh, no matter what rotation it's at. And uh, using this geometric method, we can better adapt to the sort of transformations that you see with geometry. Um, we can also use geometrically aware deep learning. So for instance, uh, in this line of work by George Palakos, you have uh, three images of a soccer or a football player, um, and you get the 2D positions that are joint, and you can, through knowledge of all three cameras, you can fuse it together to create uh, a full 3D pose, even though you don't actually have the original 3D information. Uh, you can do this not just with humans, but with objects as well. So here we're uh, doing a grasping task in a cluttered environment using the Baxter uh, as our grasping robot. Uh, and we use sort of a similar technique here where we use deep learning in sort of challenging visual conditions to Try, uh, to detect the pose. And so even with a large variety of poses with a lot of clutter, as you will uh, soon see, it can still robustly detect uh, the position of the object to allow the robot to grab it. So uh, uh, this is work from me and one of our former students, now current postdoc, uh, Drew Jagel, where uh, we just try and learn uh, motion representations from a neural network uh, in video sequences without any explicit labels. So if you have more challenging like motion types that you don't have it to the model for like you do for like the objects or the humans, then these kind of techniques can be used to just uh, be able to do some type of predictions or some type of analysis on these objects. Uh, another line of work in our lab is uh, neurotrophic or event-based cameras where traditional cameras give you a color at each pixel, whereas <coughs> event-based cameras give you the change of, uh, of color at each pixel. This allows you to do much faster response times in the, in the microsecond range and to have a much wider range of lighting conditions like you see in this video. Uh, and here you're, we're tracking each of the pixels, the motion of each of the pixels on this little <coughs> fidget spinner, even though it's spinning well past the, the normal camera rate. And so uh, this is work done by Alex Chu. Um, we also are a KUKA Innovation Award finalist, where here we're, uh, oh. Here we're, Pouring liquids from one container to another. Liquids are pretty challenging for computer vision because they, uh, they're somewhat transparent. All right. <laughs> All right, we don't need that. <laughs> but uh, liquids are pretty challenging uh, for computer vision because due to their transparency and stuff, but using uh, machine learning and computer vision techniques, we can still pour accurately from the KUKA arm to, uh, to the other container, just using vision alone without using other types of sensors. So we have a lot of 
a lot of publications and a lot of conferences, uh, most of the major computer vision ones, ICCV, ICRA, CVPR, ECCV, where Acosta is now. So if you're interested in any of our work, come to us, talk to us. We're, we're nice people, we don't bite. So uh, yeah, let us know. All right, hello, I'm Eric Eaton, and my research group works on lifelong machine learning. So imagine that we have a robot in some environment, in this case a university, and the robot encounters things like staplers, books, monitors, <coughs> office plants. But then we take that robot and we move it to a new environment, in this case a hospital, where now it encounters things like wheelchairs and walkers and other things it's never seen before. And then we move it to yet another environment, and another, and another. And the idea is that lifelong learning should allow it to continually build upon its experience over time. And so this runs in direct contrast to the current way that machine learning works, where you get a bunch of data, you learn a model, you apply that model, and then you just throw that model away, which I contend is kind of ridiculous if you think about it. It doesn't learn anywhere near like we learn. So instead, I'm interested in developing intelligent systems and robots that can learn continually over their lifetime and just build on their knowledge over time. So this enables a bunch of different aspects. The first is it allows the robot or system to rapidly learn new tasks because it has a vast repository of knowledge that it can build upon. It can also learn continually with experience over time, exhibits versatility over multiple tasks. So I'm not interested in systems that just learn one thing. I'm interested in systems that are very versatile, just like you or I. And finally, I'm interested in systems that could also learn from each other as well as humans, possibly from demonstration and things like that. And I contend that lifelong learning allows these different capabilities to occur because it allows robots and other intelligent systems to continually build upon their knowledge uh, through a process of knowledge transfer. So the foundational work that we, uh, we developed back in 2013 is this algorithm called ELLA, the Efficient Lifelong Learning Algorithm. What it allowed for the first time was to convert systems that previously had only been able to do multiple tasks and allow them to learn incrementally. And so this builds upon existing work in transfer learning and multitask learning simply to allow this idea of lifelong learning to take place. And we showed a bunch of different aspects of it. For example, we showed that we could transfer knowledge in reverse to previous tasks. So in other words, tasks which we hadn't been currently working on, our new knowledge could actually be transferred in backwards in time to improve those tasks. We applied this to a bunch of different uh, problems, including facial expression recognition, a, a landmine detection for radar imaging, and some visual object recognition. From this foundation, we built out in a bunch of different directions. The first problem we looked at was what happens if you allow the agent itself to seek out and learn new things. And so what happens if we allow it to choose its learning curriculum as to what it's going to focus on next? We then pushed into the uh, realm of reinforcement learning, specifically policy gradient reinforcement learning applied to different uh, dynamical systems where we developed algorithms to do this in a lifelong setting as well as guarantee anytime safe constraints on the policies that are resulting from this. We looked into cross-domain lifelong learning. So what happens when you have a very diverse set of tasks that you're trying to transfer knowledge between and how can we autonomously map knowledge between those different problems to allow a much more versatile learning system. We looked at lifelong imitation learning, which is really useful for robots. And so this is a recent work that's going to appear in NIPS coming up, where what happens if we have a human give demonstrations uh, to a robot? Can we learn from these and can we build on the demonstrations uh, that it might have seen on other related tasks to improve uh, a new task that it's currently working on from just a very few demonstrations? And finally, we also looked at zero-shot lifelong learning. So we tried to get rid of data in its entirety. And we said, what happens if we're just given a description of a task? Can we do that? through transfer. And so we're building on these in a bunch of different directions. One of the major projects that we currently have going on in the lab is funded by DARPA. There's a program called Lifelong Learning Machines, which was recently launched uh, uh, 
uh, from DARPA. And there's a bunch of different people working on this. We're investigating problems like how do you transfer across diverse tasks? How do you deal with non-stationary distributions in machine learning? How do you have knowledge that can be dynamically composed together to solve problems in a hierarchical fashion? How do we rapidly learn from little data? And all of this, we're taking and applying it to real world applications where there's serious risks of failure if the robot forgets uh, knowledge that's learned before through the process of catastrophic forgetting. So we want to avoid issues like this. We're also looking at other problems in lifelong deep learning, uh, perception and navigation for autonomous service robots, and some applications to medicine. So my group also develops uh, autonomous service robots. That specifically, this is uh, currently through a class that's CIS 700, where we build these robots that are designed to operate around the hallways of Penn. The, the robot uh, over on this side here, on the left-hand side, gives tours around the grass lab. We've had them give tours for visitors before. And we've also had this one on this side, which can greet someone and escort them to a specific location in the building. If you have any uh, questions or you're interested in working with my group, here's my contact information. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Okay, uh, next up we have uh, Professor Ani Che, uh, who will talk about a variety of work in her group. I can always, I can always talk to Ted. This is terrible. If it were Dan okay. Lee, he would fix it in a minute. Well, this is the other thing is I have a... I should have brought my own, I guess, is the other issue. Maybe the thing to do is oh, oh there right, you great. go. Okay. okay, it's not great. Um, let's see. Oh no. Where the slides look. Well, it's good enough. <laughs> we'll we'll go with that. We'll figure it out. Okay, so um, I'm Ani Shea, and uh, our lab is uh, the Scalable Autonomous Robotics Lab. And so in our lab, we basically concern ourselves with anything that has uh, more than you know two robots. I guess is what we. Um, and so uh, basically we cover everything uh, in terms of control and coordination. Uh, some of the recent themes in our project, uh, how do you coordinate heterogeneous capabilities, both in terms of mobility, sensing, communication, processing. Um, and then we concern ourselves of how do we allocate right, these resources to, so that the team uh, can complete the task uh, that, that it's been asked to do. Um, some of the uh, applications that we look for, right, that we are interested in uh, so standard multi-robot applications like mapping and exploration. Uh, some of the theme, the way we sort of attack, uh, attack our problems, we really try to understand things like the robot-to-robot -robot interactions, and more importantly, the robot-to-environment interactions, and how do we actually leverage those interactions to be a bit cleverer in terms of how we synthesize uh, control strategies. So uh, some of you guys might be aware, so uh, we actually have a big water tank uh, in the lab since a, a big chunk uh, of our projects is focused on uh, marine applications. And the idea here is how do you uh, collect the, the, the useful set of data, right, that actually helps us do a better job of predicting uh, modeling uh, a dynamic and uncertain environment like the ocean. Uh, so what you're seeing here are uh, the top videos are basically teams of robots trying to map uh, interesting boundaries uh, and coherent features in the flow field. And then uh, the bottom panels is showing you sort of things like uh, cooperative manipulation in a marine environment, uh, how do you coordinate 
heterogeneous assets. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is for those of you who have worked uh, with ground robots or are most familiar with ground robots, a lot of things change when you're working in this moving environment. Uh, for one, things like inertia really becomes, uh, you know, they sort of, the inertial effects dominate. Uh, another aspect of this is that the, uh, since the environment is moving and the environment uh, dynamics ends up, because of this higher inertia environment, becomes very tightly coupled with your vehicle dynamics. Whatever force your robot imparts on the environment, that force sort of uh, comes back to you. And therefore, uh, this sort of changes the game in terms of how you think about that interaction from between the robot and the environment. So some of our projects right now are focused on how do you uh, design the robot, how do you leverage that structure and fluid interaction in order to do more energy efficient navigation? Uh, how do you think about uh, the dynamics of the environment and how do you leverage the inherent motion of the environment for you to synthesize navigation plans and, to, and energy efficient trajectories uh, for your autonomous vehicles. And part, a lot of this motivation, right, is the fact that uh, in such a harsh environment, the last thing you want to do is be able to take, you know, to have to run out of energy uh, when you're doing these long-term deployments. So some of the new projects that we're currently looking for uh, sort of students uh, to participate in. So we have done some work in trying to be able to understand how human input can help uh, robots do a better job of exploring unknown environments and how we can potentially learn sort of what are the features, right, that humans are, are looking for uh, when they're sort of exploring unknown space. Uh, right now, we are working with a team of cognitive scientists and geologists uh, to try and understand how a geologist uh, reason about 3D rock formations when they're looking at these uh, natural uh, canyons. Um, and the idea here is to be able to get a better understanding of how these uh, features are formed. And so we have this new project, uh, and the idea here is the robot is going to essentially be uh, a, a sort of an extension, right, of the geologists when they're out in the field. Okay, right. anybody who's interested in, in, you know, working on or interested in, in these projects should come and talk to me. Thanks. Thanks, Ani. <laughs> All right, like I said, I'm Michael Sorbopera. I'm re representing Dr. Johnson's Rehab Robotics Lab. Uh, and essentially what we do is we focus on uh, medical applications, specifically patients who need neurorehabilitation. Um, and more specifically than that, generally of the upper extremities. So these are people who've had things like strokes, people who have cerebral palsy, um, kind of under that sort of threat of non-traumatic brain injury. So there's some sort of lesion uh, generally in the brain or some sort of deprivation of resources to their brain that have led to an impairment. Uh, and we look at doing that kind of down two avenues right now. One of them is affordable robots. So these are robots that can be deployed in low resource settings to augment the existing rehab infrastructure, which is generally deficient. And then also using mobile therapeutic assistance, which similar idea, um, but putting robots that can kind of go around on their own, interact with people. And again, you're trying to augment uh, the therapy infrastructure that exists. So the first project I'll highlight is the Rehab Cares project. The idea here is to build an entire rehab gym that can be deployed in a single crate to an area that needs more rehab. If you look at certain areas of Africa, the rates of stroke there are incredibly high, for example. And so one of the major components of that is this uh, one degree of freedom manipulator over here that has full haptic feedback. The idea being that you can understand how somebody's reacting to it, give them feedback back, how can you gamify it, uh, and what can we learn about people by using these sorts of tools. So in the top right, we have examples of patients who have both have had strokes and one of them has HIV and one of them doesn't. And so what is the impact of having HIV being coupled now with stroke, uh, which is actually shockingly prevalent in third world countries. And then on the left side, you can see how this is put into the entire gym. And you can even imagine one therapist now interacting with, you know, four patients who are all interacting again with each other, playing games against each other. Uh, the second project I'll highlight is the Panda Gym, which is Play and Neurodevelopment Assistance. And the idea here is that 
whenever you're giving therapy to anybody, the earlier you can deliver the therapy after the traumatic event that they've had, uh, the better the outcomes are going to be. And so if you have a patient who has cerebral palsy or something like that, if you can catch them at a few months old versus a few years old, then that's going to improve your outcomes drastically. And so we put babies into this little environment. Top right is kind of our original design. And we're moving towards this bottom right design. And we interact with this toy. Uh, she's called Alu. And she's got pressure sensors in her, gyros, that sort of thing. And so you can see how the subject is grabbing her, how they're kicking it. Um, and then it's got dynamic feedback. So its ears actually light up and it makes sounds and things like that, trying to motivate touch and motivate interaction. And then we also track with cameras what the baby's doing, trying to understand you know, which of these motions are intentional, which ones are non-intentional, so we can then bring that all back and say, hey, look, this subject, we can, they're functioning at this level or that level, they're ahead or behind at a really young age. Uh, the project that I'm working on is this flow and will flow project where we're trying to develop these uh, mobile robots that I mentioned. And the idea is that in these low resource areas you can do, for right now, trying to do telepresence uh, between a clinician and a patient, but understanding that in these sorts of interactions, there's a lot of information loss that happens because you just have these little small screens with cameras. So how can we put a social robot into that environment uh, to have that kind of start to build some of those interactions back in? Uh, and that kind of helps with the communication to the patient, but now to get back to the clinician, we look at how can we use computer vision to understand what a patient's doing. Uh, and with this is a lot of you know, social robots, like how do we build faces and heads that are actually effective, and how do we even test whether those sorts of things are effective? How does that vary amongst populations? Uh, and we've also had some people start to look at if you have a mobile robot in, let's say, a hospital, what are the challenges and the opportunities there? You know, hospitals are very regular with door placards everywhere, but they also have, you know, code cards coming down the hallway that you cannot be in the way of. They have rooms that are dynamically changing every time you go in. Uh, and so we've been looking at that. And the final project I'm going to highlight is the, uh, we just call it the Baxter project, because using a Baxter. And the whole idea here is if we have patients and therapists interacting in a way that we know is good, can we measure what they're doing and then transfer that to have the robot actually act like the therapist. And so we had a student in the summer actually who was developing these probabilistic channels essentially of how does the therapist interact with the patient. If we've learned that, then Nathan projects that onto the robot. Here you'll see in the video on the bottom that the batch is actually correcting the patient as they do this point to point reaching task and whether they're correct or incorrect, it kind of comes in and moves them around. And this is the first step for trying to get hands on therapy, um, which is kind of a you know, step for further forward. And I'm going to end without crickets with how to contact us. If you're interested, I'm always around. Talk to me. Dr. Johnson is always happy to meet. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Professor Michael Posa. So a lot of our research really centers around this idea of contact in robotics. Uh, when most robots that, that we're thinking about, you know, we want them to be useful, they're going to have to go out into the world, they're going to have to start touching stuff, whether it's, um, you know, this sort of silly robot on, on the left, the bear robot that I worked on in the past, or the DRC project. These robots are all going out there, they're walking, they're running, they're manipulating objects, and, and handling that contact is one of the, the sort of key challenges you have to deal with. Um, uh, that was originally motivated by this idea of, of uh, rescuing uh, soldiers from, from battlefield environments. Um, but, you know, as much as we've seen some great success, we've also seen a lot of failures, and there's probably seen highlight reels of the, of the bloopers from the DRC, where an inability to really address the, the complexity of, of interacting in the world causes pretty spectacular failure. At the end of the day, robots, for the most part, are afraid of the world. They're afraid of touching stuff. Um, if they haven't planned it, then they have you know, planned it very carefully and cautiously, it's, it's uh, gonna cause catastrophic failure. 
At the same time, humans are not afraid of touching stuff. We often you know, reach out, race against the world. We have very kind of dexterous and nimble interaction with objects uh, in a way that we gain stability often from this interaction rather than, rather than losing it. So why do robots struggle? Well, one reason I, I would say is that a lot of the, the beautiful theory that we've come up with for smooth systems just fails to transfer. Right? So our principal design ideas struggle when our differential equation, you know, the math at the heart of this, uh, stops being a nice, smooth ODE. So as soon as you start touching stuff, you have impact events, all right, so you have discontinuous uh, changes in velocity, you have discontinuous vector fields that come from friction, right? So you have like slip, slip stick events uh, when you have, say, Coulomb friction, and all sorts of other mathematical phenomena that, that arise. And, and what these sort of mathematical problems are really hiding is, is the fact that dealing with friction, dealing with impact is really hard from uh, a fundamental point of view. So our work is really sort of centered at the, the, the middle of these three things. We're, we're thinking about these non-smooth dynamics of when robots walk or touch things. And uh, we're thinking about you know, how that fits in with control theory, and particularly non-smooth control theory. And then you know, what we're really doing is trying to find algorithms, numerical algorithms based on optimization that are going to uh, address these sorts of problems. Uh, and we're also doing robotics at, 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 you know, in, in the middle. We have a, a Cassie robot, a bipedal walking robot. We're starting to do some more manipulation as well. Um, so, for instance, some of the projects we're working on, this is our uh, recent work by, uh, by Matt, um, and uh, one of the questions here is just, can we model contact, right? It's a very basic question. Can we generate, you know, computationally efficient models for, for multi-contact uh, and then make guarantees about them? So can we start addressing these, these basic questions of existence and uniqueness, or at least provide answers? Uh, when they exist. And then sort of going forward from that, can we do identification of these models? Um, and uh, and so sort of when can we when can we make guarantees and when are these guarantees bound to fail in, in ways that are important for our, our control and planning? Uh, other you know things we're working on so this is work for my for my PhD, you know, can we plan motions for highly dynamic systems that are making and breaking contact in lots of different scenarios where you know the combinatorics of these impact events Start to start to wreak havoc on on uh, traditional events uh, or approaches, uh, and then a, a sort of another kind of related but basic question here is: Can we find control policies? You know, things that are going to uh, learn or, or know to brace against the wall to prevent contact. Things that are going to grasp an object. You know, dozens of contacts between your hand and, and the object uh, in a way that's uh, stable. And, and then, can we use some of our computational techniques to verify or prove this this stability? Uh, so, and, you know, the notion of proving stability, we can find and, and sort of numerically, really numerically, explicitly calculate regions of attraction. Uh, uh, another uh, topic right now in, in our lab is this idea of Goldilocks models of walking. So very simple models are, are uh, commonly used in walking. You know, sort of imagine my robot's a point uh, and then proceed from there. And these simple models have had a lot of success in walking, uh, but they give away some complexity and some, uh, some performance. And so, you know, the sort of natural question there is, well, what kind of complexity do we need, right? If we want high performance and stability and simplicity, you know, what's the right, you know, uh, not too hot, not too cold Goldilocks area in the, in the middle there? Uh, and, you know, if, if because we're going to do this on complicated systems, we're not going to try to do it from, you know, by sitting there in, in our ivory tower thinking about it, but we want to uh, develop algorithms that are going to determine these, these questions for us. All right, so this is all about like learning, you know, uh, enabling robots to embrace the world, doing things quickly, and uh, and I'll get off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor Pato. Our, our next speaker is Professor Jamalashi, uh, who will talk about this. Uh, Okay, so yeah, my name is Jumbo. Uh, I'm going to talk about computer vision. This is the second part of it. I think CJ is going to follow up uh, another talk on computer vision. So uh, I've been very interested in, uh, in first person vision for several years now. So, first person vision is uh, you go around, you carry a camera with you, you wear the camera as you go around. So, how many people actually have done that? Wearing a GoPro or done something like that? Okay, one person, two people, okay. You should go out more. <laughs> so, uh, so everybody has a camera now on your cell phone, but
but I encourage people actually where the cameras go out because cell phone actually is a bit of a sort of strange because you take pictures uh, mostly for two reasons. What are the two reasons you take self pictures with? Selfie, first one. The second one is what? Cats. Cats. <laughs> cats. <laughs> Whatever you like, foods, cats, things that you care about, right? So uh, it tends to be a little bit narrow. So first person vision is kind of interesting because it really captures your life uh, without any filter on it. So vision has been really uh, expanding very quickly the last few years. Uh, the technology just I think, expanded extremely fast and I probably won't show you what it can do now. So what's interesting about vision is that uh, we are still in a framework where we try to think about how to teach the robot to learn to see something. But clearly, uh, as a kid, you know, we don't have uh, this uh, idea of that we had to take exams and you know, supervise to learn anything. The kids just like to learn on their own and learn, learn to, to explore. Uh, obviously, they're not just exploring randomly, but this is a sort of curiosity that drives them to do something, mimic what a doubt does. So my research really is about using the ability to see something, to learn something new. So this is a, 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 the camera that we constructed the, on top of a, a helmet, and uh, we use that to kind of look at the world around us. And the first project we want to do is basically try to see if we can identify what we are paying attention to just by the stream of video that comes through the, the camera mounted on top of the head. So this is not with the gaze tracking. Uh, this is just to pay, see if you are paying attention to anything. So it could be you pay attention because you're grabbing tactilely. Uh, it could be that you're looking at something. So the, the computer vision system is unsupervised. We are trying to use a system that can um, detect automatically uh, in the field of view what are the objects that you could be uh, interested in, both in terms of touching and, as well as terms in terms of looking. So on the right is basically ground truth. Uh, in this case, it's actually a camera on the dock head. It's got a dock cam, uh, so there's no ground truth. We can only guess what it's looking at. Uh, see if it's reasonable. Uh, so again, this is a way of a peeking into the brains, try to think about what's not just out there, but also what's in the head. Uh, we're also interested in not only pay attention to uh, what they are looking at, but also in terms of what we want to do with the picture. So here's a picture that we're looking in front of us. Uh, we want to know what we want to do with it in terms of how we want to walk into it. Uh, we want to essentially predict where we're gonna be uh, in 15 seconds ahead of us. So those are the predictions where we'll be into the picture. So not just pay attention, but also predicting what we want to do. Uh, and for this work, we again, put a GoPro on a student and we walked around, we compute the structure for motion, and we estimate the trajectory, and then we backtrack the video 15 seconds into the past. So now we know how we walk into the picture, which is the trajectory here, and we want to learn from the trajectory how we actually walk into the pictures in the future. So those are some of the trajectories. So we estimate on the right uh, is the prediction. On the left is uh, what the ground truth looks like. Uh, we're basically able to predict most time. Obviously, you go straight, but sometimes you learn how to avoid uh, people in front of you. Sometimes actually follow people. In this case, you learn how to follow someone in front of you, or, or you make a trajectory that's going around them. Um, indoors are a little more complicated. Uh, you learn how to find escalators, uh, elevators, and things they cannot see uh, and using its context. So IKEA is obviously want you to explore IKEA a lot, so you have a lot of possibility <laughs> to go into IKEA. Uh, tend to be a little bit more complicated than outdoor scenes. So obviously IKEA has an error on the floor, so you, most of the time you follow the error, but then sometimes you could zigzag off. <laughs> um, so uh, we're also interested in the question of uh, strategy, just not just predicting, but in this case, we're interested in a one-on-one -on -one basketball player. Uh, so, it's, so imagine you're looking at the person on the left and you had to strategize how to uh, you know, score on him. So this is a pretty quick decision you had to make. You had to predict where you're gonna move into. You also had to predict uh, where you're gonna shoot the ball. So where are you gonna release the ball? The neural network was able to train essentially itself by uh, identifying the important features Okay, I guess I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. All right, our next speaker is Professor Cindy Sun. Who will talk to us about origami and more and more, I think, as well.
Hi everyone, my name is Cynthia Sung. I'm in the mechanical engineering department and our group does computational design and origami robots. So our vision for the future is that everybody will be able to make a robot, whatever they want. So let me introduce Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob just moved into a new house. They have this garden that they want to take care of. Problem is that they have this plant that's really finicky and they're going to have to babysit it like 24-7. And so what they want to do is they want to create a robot that's going to help them take care of this plant. Now, if they wanted to do this today, what they'd have to do is either get a kit from a store and kind of tinker with it to make it work, or they'd have to hire a real engineer to build this robot for them. But luckily, they live in the future. And in the future, <laughs> right down the street is a Build-A-Bot store where they can take information about their tasks, and about the robot they want, and the system will help them to figure out what exactly needs to go into this design. So they can design a robot that's going to help them take care of this plant, and very quickly they'll be able to take this robot home and use it in their backyard. Now, of course, this system doesn't exist yet, and so the goal of my group is to figure out what questions and challenges we need to answer in order to make this sort of scenario a reality. So we approach this from two different angles. One is that we're looking at rapid fabrication techniques, uh, mostly origami-inspired techniques. And the idea here is that we can take advantage of a lot of planar fabrication processes, which are very well established, in order to create deployable structures, structures that we can print really fast and fold into their 3D shape. And that actually we see a lot today in products like households, um, products like grocery bags, sheet metal industry, space applications, we want to take these same advantages and apply them to rapidly fabricatable robots. The other thing we do is we create representations and tools for people to be able to design these robots themselves. So what you're seeing here is a tool that we call interactive robogami. This allows people to click and drag robot parts together so that they can compose a robot. The system keeps track of the kinematics, the underlying design constraints. It will simulate the robot to tell the person what this robot is doing so that this person who is not an engineer can still design a functional robot and be able to fabricate it in real life. So when they're happy with it, the system will automatically output a fabrication plan that within about 30 minutes you can assemble and have a very a nice little robot walking around on your desk. So when we're looking at these systems, my group looks at the underlying algorithms and computational approaches um, and a bit of fabrication processes that we need in order to make these sorts of systems. So one of the things we do is we create origami algorithms that allow us to convert 3D shapes and mechanisms into origami designs. What you're seeing here is an example of a robot that was generated from uh, one of our parameterized origami designs that can rotate around the base and has a four bar linkage on top. And what we've basically shown is that any mechanics any mechanism you want, any kinematics you want, you can create out of a fold pattern. And what's really nice about creating these out of fold patterns is that now you can also put the electronics directly on the robot, and so you have a fully integrated fabrication process with no extra wires. You print everything out in 2D, and then you fold it into a 3D shape, and you have very quickly have this thing moving around. So what we can do is we can start to integrate electronics into the mechanism itself, and we can start looking at how these uh, fabrication processes allow us to create custom robots on demand. Now, you, if, unless you're an origami enthusiast, you probably don't want to fold this yourself. And so what we've been also looking at is these self-folding processes that allow us to take these fold patterns and stick them in an oven, and they'll fold themselves into their 3D shape so that you can get automatic assembly and immediate deployment without any human intervention. Another thing we've been looking at is how these origami structures are also compliant. And so if you're folding something out of a thin film, these structures can bend, um, they can fold and unfold, and you can get very natural motions out of these thin, thin films by taking advantage of that mechanics. So one of the things we do is we try to model the mechanics of origami, and we integrate them into our computational tools so that we can create these lifelike motions. And so we can leverage the folding mechanics in order to create deployable structures, snappable structures, popping structures that can change their shape or um, that can expand or deflate. What you're seeing here is the most recent work from my group, which is this kind of bistable origami design, which can flatten completely or expand. And you'll notice that when the balloons expand, the layer pops, but when the balloons deflate, the layer stays expanded. 
And so this allows us to get these structures that we'll deploy and that we can use in real life according to these models that we've created. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Professor C.J. Taylor, who will talk about a little bit on computer vision, I think many more things as well. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and I apologize in advance for not having slides because, well, my last name starts with a T, so by the time I get up here, uh, crickets, just crickets all the time. Um, so, but I thought I'd just start off with a uh, gratuitous piece of video. So this is uh, some of the work that, that we've been doing that illustrates some of my interest in developing perception algorithms that can help um, autonomous systems do automatic, autonomous navigation and better understand their environment in order to interact with it in various kinds of, uh, kinds of ways. So this is currently one of my favorite uh, videos. This is uh, outcropping of the uh, DARPA, recently concluded DARPA Fast Light Autonomy pro Program, where the robot was given the task, go from point A to point B, and we very meanly didn't tell it about all the stuff that was in between that was trying to kill it. So uh, everything that's going on here is uh, scene understanding, position estimation, planning that's happening on board the robot um, as it's trying to make its way through uh, this very unfortunate uh, environment. Um, <clears throat> so there are a number of things going on here that, 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 that uh, uh, illustrate some of the things we're interested in. Uh, there is a question of um, how do we actually do and lever do this kind of count computation. So there's a system on board here that we specifically developed to support these kinds of these kinds of operations. Um, there is a variety of set of topics related to understanding the scene, uh, mapping the environment, doing planning, all of which are topics that are, we're uh, interested in and are ongoing. So a follow-on to this project is something called the uh, DARPA Subterranean Challenge. If I can get this to show up, which I probably can't, my computer's going to die. Um, so the DARPA Subterranean Challenge, from our perspective, involves doing some of the same things but uh, underground and backwards. So uh, this is not it. Um, but what we want to do is use some of the technology we developed here and couple this with in a team uh, uh, scenario where we're using uh, legged robots uh, developed by Ghost Robotics, which was an offshoot of uh, Mr. Kodichek's lab, as well as uh, Exxon Technologies, which builds a, another class of, uh, of uh, flying vehicles. So how do we get teams of robots to collaborate with each other and uh, do these kinds of problems uh, at larger and larger scales in underground environments where things are, things are much, much worse? Um, <clears throat> other kinds of problems that I'm working on that sort of spin out of this in environments that are not quite so nasty is how do we build semantically meaningful under, uh, representations of the environment? So there's a, a thread of work ongoing with uh, uh, one of my students which involves uh, building uh, effective models of indoor, indoor environments uh, through model automatic model selection, so we can automatically recognize hallways, doors, uh, those kinds of things. Um, another thread of work deals with how do we do a better job of understanding 3D and 3D uh, environments, uh, fusing information from multiple sensor modalities, and the like. And for fun, uh, I just mentioned the other kind of projects we're doing in agriculture and uh, uh, a very fun collaboration with colleagues at the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania where we're looking at ultrasound guided um, catheter placement, um, which is fun. So if any, any of those uh, uh, interest you, I'd be happy to talk with you later. Thanks, Professor Taylor. Okay, uh, we have Professor Mark Yim. Uh, who will talk about uh, modular things and, and beyond.
Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, four projects in my lab. Uh, we've got about a dozen projects. I actually gave most of this similar talk at the mechanical engineering seminar, so some of you may have seen some of this. I'll try to do it slightly different this time. Um, one of the projects we have is uh, an NSF project work building an autonomous robot for elder care. So this is actually a, a great thing about GRASP is that we have a lot of collaborations. Um, so this is with Michelle Johnson um, along with uh, Pam Caccioni in the nursing school. So the, the idea here is that we want to have a robot that can go into an elder care facility where there are lots of elders, interact with them, um, and do tasks like uh, delivering them to doctors when they have appointments, um, encourage them to walk, play games with them, uh, and do this with, identify them with face recognition. Um, so that's, that's actually building on a previous NSF grant. This is another one. Um, which is called the Variable Topology Trust. The, this is sponsored by AFOSR. The idea is for search and rescue. So this is a, a trust-like robot where the trust members can change their length. Um, in addition to changing the length, they can also rearrange their topology. So the, uh, they disconnect and reconnect in different ways. So this is what we call a self-reconfigurable robot. Um, the idea, the context for this is search and rescue and actually shoring. So it's has to be really strong. It's going to hold the building up as the, the building is damaged. Um, this is in collaboration with a group in Korea. Uh, so this is really interesting in the sense that it has really difficult hardware and really difficult software issues, problems to deal with. Um, so we are dealing a little bit with both. There are topological problems. Uh, I mean, analysis of seeing what kinds of forms can we make. Uh, th this is the hardware that we've been we developed so far. This is used as what we call the spiral zipper um, for prismatic joints to uh, change the length members. Another really hard thing is when the, in order to rearrange the topology, the nodes where the things come together um, have to be able to attach and detach, uh, and that's uh, fairly difficult, and that's what we're showing here. So we, this particular design has a lot of issues um, like um, uh, minimizing the angle between the two joints that are coming together is hard to design. Um, the uh, one, some of the um, software problems include doing motion planning. You have something like 18 members. It's got uh, 18 degrees of freedom. How to do motion planning for that? Um, we want to do things as well as like uh, moving around in the environment, like you saw. Uh, another project is uh, this is so this is the uh, smallest flying robot in the world. Uh, we have the. Guinness Book of World Records uh, certificate uh, that arrived a couple weeks ago. Um, so uh, there's, uh, in terms of research, there's some interesting passive stability issues and um, control in terms of design. Uh, a lot of people will ask, well, why, we, why do this? Why make something really small um, other than a record, which is nice, but kind of meaningless. Uh, you could have new things if we had cameras and whatever it could be used for um, search and rescue and that kind of thing. Um, Another reason is the DARPA just came out with this shrimp call to make a one centimeter robot. This is three centimeters. So it's a uh, $3 million worth of a reason um, for, for that. <laughs> um, another, so this is the, uh, the last one I have. So this is another example of uh, collaborative work. So one of my students and one of VJ's students got together. Um, we do self-reconfiguration and VJ does a lot more of the swarm flying robots. So we have this thing we call mo mod quad, which are flying robots that dock in space and form larger structures in midair. Um, currently, they can dock, but they can't undock. Um, there's also the question of why you'd want to do this. Um, it turns out it doesn't scale that well. As you put more and more, they start to lose their ability to uh, maneuver. Um, so we're exploring. There's some interesting academic reasons, but we're not sure about practical reasons for this one. Uh, so. Uh, uh, here's my contact information if you're interested. Hey, sir. Uh, last speaker for the day is Dan Noruega, who will talk to us about the wonderful outreach efforts in the school in Brass Wire. I feel like it always takes me a while to get set up. So there is some amazing stuff going on here. Um, 
and my job is to figure out how to communicate that to the public and how to um, help um, create the future researchers. Um, good. Okay. Uh, so I'm the head of uh, outreach for the lab, and I want to say that there are lots of reasons why um, it's important for us to be to do this outreach. But like I just said, um, we want to figure out how to communicate this work to the public. Um, you're being funded by the public, so it's important that we communicate back to the public the work that you're doing. And we want to keep growing the amount of people that are doing this research and to expand the voices that are part of that research. So that's my job, to help, um, help do that. And I want you to know that when I go out and talk to people about the work that you do, um, I get two questions all the time. One is, when are the robots going to kill us and take our jobs? <laughs> Every time. And two, how do I get my child to do this work? Which seems that they clash. <laughs> but every time, those are the questions that I get. So I have to figure out how to answer these questions. Um, and so there's lots of things that we do in this lab um, to, uh, to help do this work, mostly working with kids. Um, and you'll get uh, requests from me throughout the school year, especially at the, in the spring, um, to, a to ask for your help. And we ask that you consider helping us out um, to, uh, to help out with outreach. So one is we have a number of summer programs that work with uh, girls, that work with Philadelphia public school students, that work with diverse populations from around the, country, around the world. Um, we have lots of outreach events throughout the year. Um, we have 1,300, 1,400 students that come through our lab each year through tours. And we have many uh, grass students that help with those demonstrations for the tours. Um, we have, we're part of a robotics competition called First Lego League. I know a lot of people have done first in their careers. Um, and we host the championship at Penn in February. So we have people who volunteer as judges and referees for that event. Um, we are also, we just finished up a three year uh, NSF funded program where we worked with middle school teachers to do robotics research. We had 27 teachers come through here and impacted well over 2,000 students so far in the three years with that program. Um, we've also been developing educational robots that we've used in two different summer programs and helped uh, GSE here develop a comp computational thinking course for, um, for high school teachers. There's a lot of ways that we impact learning, human learning. Um, so we, we appreciate your help. And with both of these projects, we've had masters and PhD students um, involved with the work, both as volunteers and as paid, paid staff. Um, so many, I realize I've been behind. Many ways that you can help us in these programs. One, signing up to do demonstrations for um, either events or for tours here, signing up to be volunteers for the first Lego League programs, um, helping teach the summer programs. Like I said, we hire people to teach those summer programs. Um, helping with curriculum development for the computational thinking course for a variety of other things that come up. Um, and then we also have lots of opportunities to mentor local robotics teams. If you were a first person and you had mentors work with you, this is a way to give back and mentor local schools. It is a time intensive thing, but it's a really um, great thing to give back on. So with that, um, thank you for all that you do. Thanks, Dan. OK, folks, you have some sense, uh, a partial list of the many, many exciting uh, topics and uh, research uh, endeavors that are going on in the grass laboratory. Um, those of you who are new first year master students or maybe beginning undergraduates, uh, all of the professors have regular lab group meetings, they have regular office hours. We really, really want to work with